Sabbath, everybody. Welcome back to Bible study. I think uh, we are at a beautiful section this Sabbath. And uh, this is the lowest and the highest point of uh, Jacob's life. Let's pray and uh, let's go. Lord, again, we are thankful. We are glad that in your word we can see wisdom and we can see Jesus Christ as reaching out and reaching down and uh, lifting us up to where he is. Lord, we pray that you will guide us through the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. As you know, this is the big chiastic structure of Jacob's life. Jacob goes from Canaan to Haran, and there in Haran, there are different events in his life that bring him to a turning point, the point where he decides he wants to go back. He does not go back right away, but at one point here, he leaves, he runs away with his family, practically. And now Laban goes back, because Laban was chasing them. He goes back to Haran, and he continues his journey, but now there is another problem, and that's the ugly past. What is the problem? Or who is the problem? Esau. Is it Esau or is it Jacob? Really? <laughs> see, because quite often when it comes to our past, we see the problem in somebody else. When in fact, Jacob's problem wasn't somebody else. Yes, Esau was there, but the real problem was him. He did what he did. But yes, we have the guy called Esau, who is his own brother. And for Jacob, it is not easy to go back and meet Esau for obvious reasons. He supplanted him twice, and then he had to run away because Esau was ready to kill him. Interestingly, the story suggests that Esau was going to wait until Isaac passes away and then kill Jacob. Because Isaac, the father, was still alive, but he seemed to be old. His eyes were weak, so that's why he decided to bless his firstborn, who was Esau, but Jacob supplanted him, and now Esau was enraged. All this is happening here, right? And uh, he says, well, when my father passes, I'm going to arrange him. Little did Esau know that decades will pass and his father will be still alive. Because when Jacob finally reaches back and arrives at Canaan, his father is still alive. So there are some miscalculations, humanly speaking. But fact is, Jacob now has to go. Laban is left behind. It would be very difficult to turn back to Laban. So the only way he can go is straight ahead. And the story is very interestingly told because chapters 32 and 33 are constructed in a chiastic way. 
And the focal point of that chiasm is exactly when Jacob's name is changed into Israel. So it is verse 28, and he said, that is, the stranger that fought with him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, which means prince warrior, winner, or different kind of meanings of God, Israel, for you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed or have won. That's the moment when he has that name change. But as you know, on his way, to Haran, at one point, he meets angels. You remember the story with that huge letter reaching up to heaven, and angels were walking up and down on it. As he is coming now back, around the same point in the chiastic structure, guess what? he again meets angels. Look at verse 1 in chapter 32. So Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And this is a strong pointer that indeed we have this kind of structure here. When uh, you analyze the story on this side, when Jacob promises, as a result of that huge letter and the angels walking up and down on it, that he, since God will be faithful to him, because God first promises to be faithful to him, to be with him, to go with him, to bring him back, and Jacob says, hey, if that is the case, I am going to do this. And among other things, he says, he was going to give a, what? Tithe, right? Remember? So, a pertinent question would be, when he finally comes back, and at one point he will get back to the exact same location, did he indeed pay tithe? The text doesn't clearly indicate it. But let's look a little bit at uh, what is happening. So Jacob is now marching back home. He's not alone. He has his kids, his wives, his servants, his flocks. This is a huge caravan going somewhere. At one point, Esau hears about them. We don't know how. Or Esau gets to know about them only in the moment when Jacob's messengers go to him. Because Jacob sends a message of peace to his brother with this message. To my Lord, that is Esau, your servant, Jacob. Is that a trick? Because now, since he got the blessing of the firstborn, who's the Lord and who's the servant? Jacob is the Lord, and Esau is the servant. But now, Jacob going back, he feels he has to trick it around a little bit, and he says... Uh, to my lord, Esau, your servant, Jacob. So the messengers go, and when they come back and give a report to Jacob, they kind of speak in a way that you get the picture that when they meet Esau, he's already coming with 400 men. 
And the picture there is when you are coming with 400 men, you are not coming to play some games. You're coming for real stuff, for a battle. Maybe to arrange them all. And when uh, the messengers come back and tell him, hey, he has no good news to tell you, he didn't even um, speak to us, and he's coming with 400 men, Jacob starts trembling. And he has a word with God, asking him, Lord, didn't you tell me to go back home? And now, now what? He's going to come and kill me. And there's something very beautiful Jacob says there. He says, I'm not worthy of your mercies, but please do something. And then another trick. He prepares a huge gift for his brother. I mean, a huge. If you just read what he was planning to give him, that is a big, big amount. Verse 14. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes and 20 rams, 30 milk camels with their colts, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 foals. So that's a big flock. And uh, he sends those uh, animals ahead of him. He divides the men that are with him in a certain way. But he's still afraid. So we are here. Jacob is coming from Haran, somewhat like this. And here is the river of Jabok, and he has to continue his way. And Esau is coming from here. At one point, he passes everything over the river here, so everybody is over here, but Jacob remains on this side. The text suggests that he stays behind because he really wants to pray. He really wants to speak with God. This is a matter of life and death. So he stays, and in the middle of the night, a stranger comes up to him, puts his hand on his shoulder, and the struggle, the battle, starts between Jacob and the stranger. Let's look at verse 24 and onward. Then Jacob was left alone, and the men, so it's called the men, wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now, when he saw, who saw? The man, that he did not prevail against him, he touched or struck, the Hebrew word is stronger than just touch, like a soft touch. It's struck the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. Imagine somebody that needs a hip replacement, wrestling. In wrestling, stability is crucial. So if up to this point, Jacob still had at least theoretically the possibility of winning, once his uh, hip was struck, there is no way for him to win here, right? He struck the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him, and he said, let me go for the day breaks. So the stranger 
wants to go. But he said, who said? Jacob, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The motive of blessing is very interesting here. Because Jacob's problem started with the blessing. Right? That's why he had to run away. Because of the blessing he got from his father in a fraudulent, I would say, way. But he's asking for a blessing. At this time, I'm pretty sure he already realizes the man he's fighting is not a common man. He's not fighting just a usual human being. I will not let you go unless you bless me, he says. So he said to him, that is, the stranger said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. Jacob meaning what? Deceiver, supplanter. So in Jacob's mind, now everything comes back. There is a very interesting psychological reality when you have a problem and then somebody attacks you, you focus on that attack. You're fighting that stranger off. But now, when the name is brought into picture, you're going back to where you were. So, not only do you have this stranger that you try to fight off, you still have your underlying problem, the name that represents your character. And he said, so this is the moment I'm uh, pointing to, right? This is the, the little chiasm pointing to verse 28. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob. You're no longer the supplanter, the deceiver, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Okay, so if he struggled with God, then who was the person he was struggling with? Was that God himself? Was that Jesus Christ? himself, because Jesus Christ is both God and man, but here we still deal with Jesus Christ, if he indeed is the stranger, before incarnation, which is a very interesting reality. So it means that before incarnation, when Jesus came in body, in human body, he could already take on human body or human-like body even in the past, which is a very interesting biblical reality. And you can see that in different parts of the Bible. But what man did he struggle with? Jacob. Because man is plural. What man? Because he did not meet Esau yet. You may think Laban, that was a struggle there. Yeah, I would say so. He struggled with Esau previously. There was no direct confrontation. I see the text very concise and somewhat puzzling. Because I have the impression the text even suggests that Jacob here, in his confrontation with the stranger, has a confrontation with his own persona as well. Because the first man he has to overcome is Jacob himself. And in this picture of the stranger fighting you, fighting me, I see myself sometimes when I have the self-struggle. Do you ever have uh, self-struggles? When you have the impression somebody within you fights you? 
This is a very interesting reality, and it's quite possible that the picture points beyond the physical reality that was happening there. It is that moment when God fighting or struggling with somebody finally overcomes, but instead of him shouting and jumping, saying, hey, I won, he gives victory to you, and he says, you won. You fought, you struggled, and you prevailed. Isn't that exactly righteousness by faith? That's a beautiful picture here. And absolutely amazing, because in the very moment when Jacob fights against this stranger is when he's the closest to that stranger. It is being in God's arms while you are struggling with Him. And to me, that is an amazing and heartwarming picture. But let's go on and see how now everything mirrors back. Verse 29, Then Jacob asked, saying, Tell me your name, I pray. Remember, before the name change, the stranger asked Jacob what his name was. Now, Jacob is asking the stranger, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. It's hard to really understand why the stranger asks Jacob, why are you asking my name? It seems to me that, yes, the stranger, when he asks back, why are you asking about my name, kind of implies, hey, you should know by now. You should have realized what is happening here. So Jacob called the name of the place so it seems that he recognizing something calls that place Peniel, which means the face of God. So he recognizes that God is there. So if we had doubts that the stranger was God, Jacob kind of confirms that the stranger indeed was God. Because he names the place Peniel. For I have seen God face to face. Right? So, if somebody will tell you, you cannot see God face to face because you have a Bible verse for that. Uh, you can look, for instance, in uh, John chapter 1, verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. So could Jacob see God face to face if no one has seen God at any time? Yes. Because the God he's seeing there is not God the Father that John chapter 1 verse 18 speaks about. Because there clearly God is God the Father, and the only that saw, that has ever seen God the Father is Jesus Christ. But here, the God Jacob sees face to face is whom? Jesus Christ. Confirming indeed that Jesus Christ is God. I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved, just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. And that again mirrors back to the hip 
in the first part of this little chiasm. That's the beautiful story of uh, Jacob's name change. And the result? Well, the result, he continues his way. He lines up his people. And now he goes all the way to the front of his caravan. And this is a beautiful moment when he goes ahead and bows seven times. Seven times. And then what happens there is more you can imagine. Because they fall on one another's neck and they cry. And this looks like a fountain, like a well from which that brotherhood erupts. And they are together reconciling, crying like some children. Amazing picture, isn't it? So Jacob tries to convince Esau to take the gift. Verse 8 in chapter 33. So this is happening after they already met. In verse 4, previously, it says that Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. So now we are past that moment and verse 8 says, Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But this is interesting because they have already met. They have already wept. And in his mind, he is still seeking for favor with his Lord. See what is happening? It's like you got stuck there. Release now the button. It's passed. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, no, please, if I have now found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand inasmuch as I have seen your face as though I had seen the face of God. Now oh, that to me is amazing. And you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you because God has dealt graciously with me and because I have enough. So he urged him and he took it. So Esau eventually took it. There are two interesting elements here. One, Jacob says the reason he's giving the gift is because God has dealt graciously with him. When Jacob promised to give a tithe, didn't he promise to give a tithe exactly because of that? Because God was going to deal with him graciously, he promised a tithe. And the other thing is, he says he saw Esau's face as though he saw the face of God. In Esau, he recognizes the face of God. The only moment previous to this one where somebody gives tithe to somebody is Abraham giving tithe to King Melchizedek, a priest of the Most High, the text says. And here Esau seems to be seen by Jacob as being at least the priest of his family. Because Jacob does recognize Esau at this point as being the firstborn. He's the Lord and Jacob is the servant. And if he's the firstborn, he's also the priest of the family. 
That's why some suggest that in giving that huge gift to Esau, Jacob actually fulfills his promise of tithing up here. Could you follow the reasoning? It's a little, it's a little st stretchy, <laughs> but some people have gotten to that conclusion. I'm not sure about it. I just wanted you to know that there is a way of looking at it like that. Because in Esau, Jacob recognizes the face of God, that's why he actually is giving to Esau, to God through Esau, that tithe. There's another possible explanation. We will see it later on when God specifically tells Jacob to go back to Bethel. And uh, Jacob goes to Bethel with his family and there are some things happening there. And some would say that's where he fulfills his promise. In any case, what is amazing here is how God brings Jacob into this deep conversion experience. And as a result of uh, that, he reconciles to his brother as well. Questions? So the question is, is there any meaning in the fact that before the meeting actually happens, this is what says in verse 3, 3, chapter 33, then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. This is another indication in some people's eyes that he looks at Esau, his brother, as being the priest of their family and a representative of God because he bows down in front of him seven times. Seven being that perfect number. Seven representing the, the total or the complete experience he is going through. But it's not worship really there. It's more like expression of uh, respect of uh, I am the servant and you are the Lord. Which is weird, right? Again, because it should have been the other way around. And the story later confirms that even if this happens for the sake of reconciliation, Jacob still goes on being the Lord. Yeah, that's a very good question. Why, why didn't he just rely on God rather than on his own ability of conflict management? Because he definitely tries to implement some very human tactics. One is uh, the message, although the message itself I don't think should be interpreted in that key. But the gift, I think, goes in that direction. It's like paying off your debt, giving back to Esau what belonged to him or would have belonged to him had you not taken away the firstborn blessing, even more probably than uh, that would have represented. Why doesn't Jacob rely on God, God and God alone, since he has already seen God protecting him in a special way in this moment here when he has to encounter Laban. Laban, the guy that was running after him. And God was very present there. On one side, he spoke with him. God spoke with Jacob. But God even showed up to Laban. So Jacob should have known what God is capable of. An interesting component of the story here is also this uh, 
focus of uh, a little chiasm. You have that chiasm on the back of your worksheet. You remember when Laban came and did the house search. It was a very difficult moment for Jacob. So Laban comes and searches everywhere, but he cannot find the gods or the idols, the household idols he's looking for because Rachel is sitting on them in the saddle of the camel. So he can't find them. So that means that Jacob travels on still having idols in his house. Would you expect that? And the moment when they finally get rid of the idols is no earlier than uh, that very sad or, or dramatic family event when Dina is raped. Only after that, they, as a family, get rid of all their idols. So we still have some mix here. Now, is Jacob not in a good relationship with God? I think he is in a good relationship with God. Look at chapter 32, verse 9. This is exactly after his messengers come back and they tell him Esau is coming with 400 men. Let me read from verse 7. So Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two companies. And he said, if Esau comes to the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will escape. So he already has a strategy. But then Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac. You can also translate God of my grandfather Abraham and of my father Isaac. The Lord who said to me. So he still relies on God. But there clearly is some humanness in his way of uh, relationing with God. Return to your country and to your family, and I will deal well with you. I am not worthy of the least of all the mercies and of all the truth which you have shown your servant. In passing, please notice that he speaks about mercies and truth. The same two elements that later on appear in Jesus Christ. Full of grace and truth. So mercies and truth, which you have shown your servant, for I crossed over this Jordan with my staff, and now I have become two companies. Deliver me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, lest he come and attack me and the mother with the children. For you said, I will surely treat you well, and make your descendants as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. So he does go to God. But there are some human elements in it, for sure. And even after this moment, he still does his uh, human tactiquing, the gift and uh, arranging. So even after he has confirmation from God, he still does the dividings and protecting the dearest. So humanness is still there. Yeah, but don't we do the same? Don't we see ourselves reflected back in his story? For sure. We pray, we pray, and we get a confirmation that God is going to be with us, and then we Stand up and go about our tactics. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good question. When uh, those writers wrote the Bible, or specific segments of the Bible, did they know what they were doing? 
did they know they were creating chiastic structures? I believe the answer is yes. Yeah. Because this is the Hebraic way of writing, at least in ancient times. Now, of course, with uh, the cultural mix that uh, the Jews have uh, incurred throughout history, that got kind of diluted. But in the Old Testament, in a specific way, and partially even in the New Testament, because the Apostle Paul uses chiastic structures as well, I could point you almost every Sabbath when I preach from uh, Ephesians to some chiasms that I don't want to overburden with uh, structural things. But yes, I believe they did know what they were doing because the constructions, at least in some places, are very, very vivid. Look, for instance, you have the big chiasm here of this entire story. Okay? And see how it's laid out. You have at letter L in the second part here, letter L, you have the theophany of God with angels, which is happening right here. How come in this section you have a theophany with angels exactly in the same area? It's intentionality. It's divine intentionality or human intentionality or both. I would go with both. If you go through the Bible, you will see that this is not just one author knowing it. It is almost every author employing it. So you may even ask the question, is this possibly God's way of thinking? Is this how God deals with reality? Is this our natural way of thinking, of reasoning? I believe you can infer that this is God's way of uh, speaking about reality. So yes, we can easily look at a chiasm as being a literary device. The way you tell a story, so the story will be compelling, and the story will lead the reader somewhere. And I think this is the big benefit of the chiasm. If you see a chiasm, then you immediately can think and say, okay, so where is this taking me? Is this taking me somewhere? do something very specific. There's something important in this story. And in this big chiasm, yes, there is something important happening right here at the focal point. Joseph is born, and from this point on, the rest of the book of Genesis is about Joseph. So it's like indicating what's next. But at the same time, it's the moment when Jacob decides to go back home so it indicates that now we are going back. It seems that this is the natural way of things happening. Let me give you an example. Suppose Pastor Joe came from Florida, spent a few years in California. So this is Florida spent a few years in California, and then went somewhere else, maybe back to Florida. Isn't this a natural way of things just happening? But you can replace Florida with something else, Colorado. There's a good likelihood that you will see some elements mirrored back on this side, from what happened on this side. See? So yeah, I believe God is in it, but I strongly believe God did not leave out the reasoning of the human beings that wrote it. So somehow, this is a divine human production, 
that we call scriptures or the Bible, in which God's way of uh, reflecting at reality and leading us to the bigger reality of history, Jesus Christ, is presented in a certain way in which human elements, those that wrote it, have their own part to play. Because the human beings that write it, they are the writers, but the author is God because it was through the Holy Spirit that those people wrote through the inspiration, if uh, I may use that modern term. Good question, yeah. So when, when after that um, struggle happens, and this is in Genesis 32, in verse 25, Jesus strikes the socket of his hip, the socket is out of joint. Then Jacob asks for blessing. And in verse 27, the stranger says, what is your name? So then the question is, is this some sort of confrontation with the past? God prompting Jacob to think, to process, to own the mess of the past? I think the answer can easily be yes, because that's the essence of conversion. Conversion is facing the mess. A mess that is not behind you. Biblically, the mess of the past is in front of you. You can see in the book of Psalms, several times, the psalmist praying like this, Lord, my sins are in front of me. In Greek philosophy, or based on Greek philosophy, we were taught that we are facing the future, we are going this way to the future, and our past is behind us. Biblically, it's the other way around. And logically, it's the other way around. We go to the future backwards, we don't see the future, only God knows the future, and we can know from the future as much as He re reveals to us. Does that make sense? But our past is where? In front of us. We know the past. So we have to face our past, the ugly past. And to this day, in uh, psychology, there is this segment of uh, dealing with your issues where you go back and uh, reflect and reason and almost re-experience what happened in the past. Now, I don't want to suggest that we have to read too much postmodern psychology back into the Bible. That's not my point. But I believe there is a natural way of God dealing with us, confronting us with our past, and then erasing our past, giving us a new identity based on which we can continue the journey. And now, because of the experience of Jabok right here, when we continue the journey backwards to the future, based on what God tells us that I will be indeed with you, when I look in front of me and I see what is there, I don't see the ugly past, I see what God just has done for me right now. Does that make sense? Let me expand it just a little bit more. When somebody gets the experience of conversion, there are plenty of ugly stuff in the past. But once conversion happens, the immediate experience that you can relate to, that you look back on, is not that ugly past. But it is the immediate past that you have just experienced with God. And now here is the challenge. The devil will try to unearth the ugly past. The past that God said, I erased it. Instead of 
having you focused on uh, the conversion experience and God's blessings from that point on, you may be tempted to go back to the ugly past. But since you've had this experience with Jesus Christ at the river of Jabbok, you can continue your journey relying on Him and knowing what happened right here. So you don't have to look further back in your past. We all have a past. And psychologically, the past can be put in a bracket, but from your brain, it's not erased. That's why you need to rely on God at every step of the way, knowing what He has done for you, and continuing your journey based on that, not going back to what God said, mm, I don't care about that. Amen? Yes. Lord, we thank you so much for the story of Jacob that mirrors back to us our own experience. We pray that each one of us will be mindful and focusing on that experience with you instead on the ugly past that can disturb and ruin us. We pray that you will continue to guide us, reveal yourself and your plans to us in Jesus' name, through the Holy Spirit. Amen.